Now, for those of you who keep up with important things, I mentioned a while back that my wireless mouse died. I have a new wireless mouse. Got two, actually, one from Logitech. Logitech always makes good stuff. But I also got one from Shark. It's working very well so far. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, moan. You can shove your opinion up your ass. That way your head has something to keep it company. Don't forget, the ever-present, the most likely third possibility, you are wrong, and I am right. Feeling pretty mellow today. Got some time off from all of the gigs I have in life that require me to be in a particular place at a particular time. Sometimes I get caught up on a lot of stuff, and also been listening to a lot of Pink Floyd music, been going back down the Pink Floyd memory lane. By the way, this is Stating the Obvious Podcast, the weapons platform from which I launch a cruise missile of my intellect. It holds it on and it destroys stupid motherfuckers all around the world. All around the world, yes. And there are stupid motherfuckers all around the world. Sometimes people survive the initial nuclear blast. Fortunately, we have a 50 caliber machine gun we can mow them down with. Anyway, welcome. I'm, I am feeling pretty mellow. This might actually not turn into a rant fest. What I'm doing today is an sort of introductory episode, in essence. I just want to go back and cover some bases, and this is going to be put out as the podcast that if you're new to the show, you should listen to this one. I did a introductory, introductory, if I can fucking enunciate correctly. I did an introductory episode back when I started the podcast, and later on I came along and updated it. And I think that one's still out there, but it's fairly... Well, I haven't listened to it, but I'm guessing it's probably fairly inaccurate and out of date. Because unlike those of you who just mindlessly repeat whatever the Democrats or the Republicans are telling you, this podcast and my ideas, my philosophies, my concepts, my theses, <laughs> theses, that sounds dirty. <laughs> I put my theses inside you. <laughs> There's evolution takes place here, unlike in the rest of you where you just fucking mindlessly believe whatever's on television. How about them Broncos? All right, anyway. So let's go down this. For this show, I actually have notes. I actually made notes. This is shocking. So let's let's try using the notes. Randy, what's up? Randy, she's over there. So first of all, who are we? Well, we, I am great one himself. I am the founder of the Cynical Libertarian Society. I founded the Cynical Libertarian Society bleh, founded the Cynical Libertarian Society back in the days, first of all, before I had ever heard of anarcho-capitalism. And this was back in the days when, like those of you who are stupid, I thought anarchy was lawlessness and disorder and you know Mad Max road warriors driving around shooting people and all this other stuff because of course like most of you out there I was educated in the public school system which is another way of saying I was not educated fortunately my mother taught me how to read books before I ever went to school we had a large number of books at home I spent a lot of time with the library and my mother who is a hardcore liberal democrat somehow or another managed to teach me to think on my own. I'm still not sure exactly how that worked and how I escaped indoctrination, but oh well. Anyway, I founded the Cynical Libertarian Society way back in the day before I knew what an anarcho-capitalist was. And I considered changing the name to the Cynical Anarcho-Capitalist Society. Or, you know, There's also a thing known as anarcho-cynicalist, which I haven't done enough research to figure out if I'm an anarcho-cynicalist or not, but I don't think I am, because I am definitely an anarcho-capitalist. I'm just cynical about the whole fucking thing. Anyway, that's why it's called anarcho- the- that's why it's called Cynical Libertarian Society. I can't fucking talk. 
and not something else. It was also when I founded the... My brain. Randy, my brain hurts. My fucking brain hurts. When I founded the Cynical Libertarian Society, I was mostly a right-wing minarchist, as opposed to now where I am a full-fledged anarcho-capitalist. In the control room over there is the lovely and adorable Randy. We go way back. She and I have been pals for a while. Randy is not an anarcho-capitalist, nor is she a libertarian. She's a Republican. And sometimes I have to make fun of her over that, but she can handle it, usually. Plus, she looks really cute when she's bending over. And that's her main purpose. She's also the audio engineer. She keeps me in line and on track as much as she can. Reminds me of what I'm supposed to be talking about. Reminds me of what I was talking about when I start digressing and go off. And she just generally helps out with things like that. Yes, she is cute. No, you cannot have naked pictures of her or anything else. You can, however, send us naked pictures of yourself, especially if you are physically attractive. Cynical Libertarian Society is on the internet. C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C dot com is the email. Not the email. God, the URL. It's going to be a long, long podcast. For those of you who aren't very bright, those are the first three letters of the words Cynical Libertarian and Society. I did not get CynicalLibertarianSociety.com because that's a lot to type, and I understand a lot of you out there have really short attention spans. And then there's also just the spelling factor of spelling Cynical Libertarian Society. God knows how many times I fuck it up. And if anything, access to the knowledge and wisdom that I present here needs to be easy. That's why it's C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com, CynicalLibertarianSociety.com. Now, the email address, which is different from a URL, even though apparently I'm not grasping that at the moment. And I've had coffee. I've had my entire six cups of coffee. I should be semi-functional and semi-literate, but apparently not. The email address, if you want to send us those naked pictures or if you want to send any kind of comments, commentary, questions, insults, compliments, what the fuck ever you want to email to us, you can send that to god at c-y-n-l-i-b-s-o-c dot com. That's dog spelled backwards. G-O-D, god at c-y-n-l-i-b-s-o-c dot com. Anything you send, any comments you send, any emails you send, any comments you leave on the website, any comments you leave anywhere, like on YouTube or so forth and so on, Facebook, wherever, I'll do what I want with them. They may end up on the show, I will make fun of you, whatever. So do not be under any illusion that anything you send to God at CYNLIBSOC.com is private, because it's not. Unless you send, now if you send a picture of yourself and you're naked and you're good looking and you're nice to us, we're not going to put that out and make fun of you. But if you're an idiot, we're going to make fun of you. I don't really have a need to, yeah, anyone anyone who's an anarcho-capitalist or even going in the right direction, I'm not going to make fun of you. But if you're, if you're a statist idiot, I'm going to make fun of you. It's just that simple. The theme song for this show is a song called You Know I'm Right. It's by David Gilmore. He is guitar player for the band Pink Floyd, which I've been listening to a lot lately because I've always been a big Floyd fan. They are my favorite band ever, but I haven't really sat down and listened to two of the Floyd albums lately. So I've been pulling out my Floyd albums, the actual vinyl albums, not the DVDs, not the MP3s. The actual vinyl albums. Oh, it sounds so glorious to listen to. My boys, the Pink Floyd. Back in the day, they at one point were called the Pink Floyd. Trivia fact of the day. The song You Know I'm Right is off of his 1984 album About Face. It's a, it's a pretty good album. His most recent solo offering... What the hell is the name of his recent... God damn it. On an Island. I like 
David Gilmour has three solo albums. On an Island, his most recent, which is brilliant. When I first listened to it, I didn't like it very much. And then I listened to it again. It took a while for the brilliance to actually permeate my little brain, is what happened there. And then there's About Face, which is the album that You Know I'm Right. By the way, the song You Know I'm Right, he wrote that about me. That's the, that's the album that song comes from. And then his first solo album was simply called David Gilmour. And it's much more rock and roll and hard guitar and also well worth listening to. So you should pick up all three of his albums if you get the chance. Theme song, email, who we are. So, Stating the Obvious podcast. Let's talk about the podcast itself. The Stating the Obvious podcast is one of three podcasts we do here at the Cynical Libertarian Society. The other ones are Anarchy Moment and Cult of Personality. I haven't done a Cult of Personality in a long time, though I have one coming up. The Cult of Personality podcast was specifically founded to discuss your Lord and Savior, Hussein Obama, the current King of the United States, the first affirmative action president, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sadly, when Hussein Obama moves on and is no longer King of the United States, I will have to rebrand it a little bit in order to make fun of whoever becomes the next King of the United States, although I suppose we may have to refer to her as the Queen of the United States because, of course, the next president of the United States is going to be Hillary Clinton. But we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Anarchy Moment is a podcast I do which is no frills. There's no music, no opening music, no closing music. I usually just do those on my own. Randy isn't here for that. It's me using my little Zoom H2 recorder and just having more in the spur of the moment, on the spur of the moment, frank discussions, sometimes rants. Anarchy moments tend to happen when I have an epiphany about something or if I want to rant about something and I just grab the recorder and I talk for however long I need to talk to get that out of my system and then it's done. As opposed to cult of personality and stating the obvious, both of which generally speaking, have fixed lengths. Stating the obvious is usually 52 minutes and some change long. Sometimes we go short. This one today, in fact, might be short because I'm only going to do the intro stuff and if we finish early, we're going to cut early and be done with it. And sometimes stating the obvious goes long if I need to finish something up and I don't want to make it a two-parter or a three-parter or a four-parter, sometimes there are multiple parts to the podcast. When recording any of my podcast, typically speaking, I do not have notes. I certainly don't have scripts. These are unscripted the notes are, when I have notes, is just stuff scribbled on a piece of paper like now. And generally speaking, there's no editing that takes place and there's no pausing of the recording. We start the recorder and I speak. And I do my thing. And there's a reason for this. First of all, verbal communication is something that people need to be good at if they want to be good at persuading and communicating. And with so many podcasts and YouTube videos and all these other formats where people are communicating, there's all this editing and polishing that takes place. And so what you see is never the actual person or the thought process behind it and the flaws and the peaks and the valleys and all of these other things. And so by doing the podcast, and I, I hate to use the word genuine because genuine keeps coming into my brain, but I'm so fucking sick of the word genuine. It's overused in the realm of social media. Because everybody, well, you have to be genuine. You have to get on Facebook, and, and if you want to get likes, you have to be genuine and be, oh, fuck you, 
fuck you. So I'm just really sick of the word genuine. It's up there with awesome. Ooh, it's so awesome. Fuck you. You're a fucking tool. So I'm not trying to be genuine, but in doing these podcasts without editing and just hitting record and going, what I'm really doing is pushing myself to be better. This is like a radio show or a live speech where you have people listening and you're talking and there are no do-overs. There's no going back. There's no editing. And putting this pressure on myself forces me to up my game. It forces me to think about what I'm saying and how I'm saying it because if I say something where I'm wrong or if I say something that is offensive in the wrong way to the wrong people, because if you've listened to any episodes of this podcast, you know that being offensive is not off limits. You know, whatever I say, I have to stand behind it because I said it. Or if I say something stupid or wrong or excessively offensive, then I have to catch myself and I have to explain myself and I have to admit that, okay, you know, what I just said wasn't actually true. And you'll hear these things a lot in the podcast. When, for example, I'll be bitching about women and I'll say, well, women do this. And it's like, okay, wait, I don't really mean women. I mean femistatist do this. Right. Or I will say, well, blah, 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 you know, homosexuals, blah, well, all right, hold it. I don't really mean all homosexuals. What I mean is the homosexuals who are militant GLBTers. And so by doing this live, I have to pay attention to what I'm saying at all times. And I have to edit things before I speak. That's why when I'm doing the podcast, you will hear me pausing as opposed to in the edited podcast and the YouTube videos where everything is just talking like this and there's no breaths in between any of the words and the words just keep coming like this and they're like this and like this and they're just talking like this. I have silence in the podcast because I'm taking time to consider what am I going to say next because I seek to communicate with clarity and with accuracy and I seek to do it that way in the moment and I seek to do it that way because communicating is a skill and like any skill you have to practice it to be good at it. So anybody can sound good in a podcast or a video that's been that's had you know the shit edited out of it. Anybody can spend three hours recording a podcast and then edit it down to a 20-minute podcast that sounds really great. It's sort of like music nowadays. Actually, music for a long time. I've said this before. Anybody can go into the studio and create an album. The true test of a musician is, can you perform live? That's why I tend to hold my reservations about any musical group being good or bad until I've heard them performing live. Because anybody, anybody, even me, even I, could cut a studio album. I think that's all I needed to say about why I don't edit. The other reason I don't edit is just because I have too much shit to do. I know people who do podcasts that do editing and they spend sometimes hours editing a podcast episode. It's like, I I have shit to do. I have friends, I have hobbies, I have podcasts to do, I have websites to work on, I have writing to do, I have reading and research to do, I have gigs to do, I have money to make, I have friends to hang out with, I have martinis to drink. So I don't really have time or interest in editing, so that's another reason I don't do it. You're getting pure, pretty much uncut podcasting here.
And sometimes you hear silence because I'm taking a drink of water or beer or a martini or a gin and tonic or whatever. My flavor of the moment might be. Did all of that. Publishing schedule. Currently, I am attempting to publish a podcast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I missed, I had a snafu this last week, actually. The podcast that was supposed to publish on Friday, I forgot to fucking schedule it. And I thought I had a podcast scheduled for Monday, and I didn't. But on Monday, that's when I noticed that Fridays didn't publish. So I published Fridays on Mondays. So technically, I missed Monday's podcast, but technically, I missed Friday's podcast. Anyway, the point is, the publishing schedule, it is what it is. I publish if I can. When things happen and I get really busy, it may fall behind. At one point, we went an entire year where only one episode of Stating the Obvious came out. So check in Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, RSSs. We're also on Stitcher. If the podcast is there, then we're there. If it's not, we're not. Final note about Cynical Libertarian Society. Every once when I get this question is, how does a person join or become a member of the Cynical Libertarian Society? The answer is you don't because Cynical Libertarians do not join things. We are not joiners. Cynical Libertarian Society has a membership of one, and that one would be me. It's not to, you know, ostracize you or anything like that. It's just, if you truly are a cynical libertarian, if you truly are a cynical anarcho-capitalist, the last thing you want to do is join somebody else's organization that's going to tell you how to think. If you need somebody to tell you how to think, that's what Rush Limbaugh is there for, because as he... I haven't listened to Rush Limbaugh in a while. Easily. My God, it's been... Randy, how long... Well, you wouldn't know. It's been at least six months, maybe even a year. I like listening to Limbaugh every now... I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh, like, religiously back in the day. He helped me make my progression from being a hardcore left-wing statist. Since this is an intro, I should throw this one out, too. I don't need... You know, commentary from the peanut gallery about how I don't understand, yada, yada, yada. What uh, those of you listening to this podcast need to understand is that I've been there and done that. I have been a theist. I have been a left-wing liberal Democrat. I have been a right-wing Republican. I have... You know, I whatever. I have supported welfare. I've been against welfare. I've believed in global warming. I have believed in free abortions for women paid for by the government because there's no such thing as free. I mean, what I'm saying is that when you stupid people out there, when you hear this podcast and I talk about how we can build roads without the government and you start trying to explain to me why we can't, what you need to understand is that I have already been in a position where I believed that roads couldn't be built without the government murdering people. And when you try to persuade me that we need the government to kill people, otherwise there won't be any roads, it's not going to work because I can make your argument better than you can because I've already made your argument because I've already believed in that argument in the past and I've abandoned it. So I'm not really interested in people trying to convince me that I'm wrong. And this begins to move into upcoming topics. I'm going to drop that for now and we'll come back to it. So let me get into the bulk of the notes here. That was that was just the build up. It took me 24 minutes to get through. That was just the build up. That was the the minutia stuff. Here's the things that you need to know about Stating the Obvious podcast and every podcast from the Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the internet. First of all, understand that this is not a current events show. I don't talk about 
current events, I often talk about things that happened years and years ago. And of course, the stupid people will always say, well, that happened two months ago. What does that matter? Which always cracks me up because, of course, slavery happened a hundred years ago. And yet, most white people in the United States still have a complex about it. And most black people in the United States still have a complex about it. But it happened a hundred years ago. right? I mean, Jesus was nailed to a tree 2,000 years ago, yet some of you just can't shut the fuck up about Jesus. So the idea that because something happened two months ago makes it irrelevant only serves to illustrate how stupid you are and how, as many of you don't, many of you have no concept of context and history in the past and why these things are important. I blame the internet <clears throat> and social media and my dying voice. <coughs> yes, that's called not editing. You get to listen to me cough. And the general capitalism, consumer culture we've created, where everything is short attention span, everything is fast. You know, every the YouTube videos, 30 seconds. Twitter, 140 characters. You know, everything has to be short and now and in the moment for people to digest it. Stating the obvious is not a current events show where I talk about whatever is cool right this moment because I don't give a fuck about what is cool right this moment. This is a philosophy show where I talk about things in a philosophical sense in a broader spectrum. I just finished listening to an audiobook about the French and Indian War which was pretty goddamn brilliant and very interesting because it talks about, most of you don't even know what that war was, but it talks about the French and Indian War, which happened here in the United States prior to the American Revolution, and how these things contributed to the American Revolution and motivated it. And so it's essentially background history for that event. And most people who don't know anything about history, and that is most of you, have this very incorrect view of the Founding Fathers and everything that led to the Declaration of Independence and yada, yada, yada. And so this is why history is important. This is why what has happened before is important. This is why the past is important. And that's why stating the obvious is not a current events show. Because current events are important, but they're less important than the things that have led to them. Right? It's 9-11. Oh, look, some people flew some airplanes into some buildings. Well, gee, I wonder why they did that. I've talked about this at length before. I mean, did they really do that because they woke up one morning and went, hey, Ahmed, I sure hate those Americans because they have DVD players and internet pornography. Let's go kill them. No, they did that because of years and years and years of history of Western countries fucking with their governments, their societies, their politics, redrawing the maps in the Middle East, creating countries where countries didn't exist, propping up puppet governments, trying to overthrow governments, you know, taking sides in wars, all of this other stuff. 9-11 happened for a reason. Well, you hate America. I can hear the fucking right-wingers out there right now. You hate America. I don't hate America, I hate stupid people. And if you think that 9-11 just happened because Ahmed woke up one morning with a corn cob up his ass, you're wrong. And there's this very distinct inability for citizens of the United States, the country we live in, by the way, is called the United States. It's not called America. America is the continent. So, I mean, we, we, I live in a country where the people around me don't even know the fucking name of the country. I love them. I'm from America. Okay, which country? Well, America. Okay, Canada, 
the United States, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil. Which which country on the American continent? Well, I'm from America. Well, you're a fucking idiot. The name of your country is the United States. But you people are that fucking dumb. And so when you send me emails going, you don't understand them, they're fucking, them brown people, they flew them buildings into that airplane because they hate America. You don't even know the name of the country you live in. You can keep your fucking political opinions to yourself. Okay, because nobody with a brain is going to take you seriously. So shut the fuck up. All right, see, now I'm digressing. Randy, why are you not, like, waving to me and holding up the little you are digressing sign? I know. Wait, what the fuck was I... Because I have notes for once. Let me find out. What was I supposed to be talking about? This is what you should understand, too. I digress a lot. These things happen. I actually have notes today, so I know what to go back to. Normally, I don't have notes. That's why Randy is here, because she keeps track of what I'm supposed to be talking about, and she writes it on the little whiteboard so that I can get back on top. This is not a current events show. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about. I don't do current events. I talk about things that lead up to current events. I'm talking about past history because history is important. I didn't realize this when I was in public school because, of course, I was in public school and the purpose of public school is not to educate people. It's to make people stupid. So anyhow, at the time, I hated history. Now, of course, I love reading about history. And if I remembered the name of this book I just listened to, I would recommend it, but I don't. I'll try to remember. I should get that in the reading list. Let me put that on my list of notes. Here's my list of notes. Okay, done. It's on there. It's on my to-do list, which is huge. <laughs> so she said. What is an anarcho-capitalist? I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth here, but simply put, an anarcho-capitalist is somebody who believes in anarchy, which is the absence of rulers, not the absence of rules, and capitalism, which of course is the free exchange of goods and services. An anarcho-capitalist is somebody who adheres to the zero aggression principle or the non-aggression principle is called one or the other by assorted people. I like zero aggression principle better because the initials are ZAP, ZAP, as opposed to the non-aggression principle uh, where the initials are NAP. And zapping is active, whereas napping is passive. So I like ZAP better. The other thing that differentiates an anar anarcho-capitalist from everybody else is that anarcho-capitalists respect privacy. Privacy. Well, they do respect privacy. They respect property rights. And I don't like calling it property rights, and I'm working on a different term, because to say a person has property rights is to use the word rights. And people are very confused about what the fuck a right is. And I submit that rights do not exist. You don't have rights. This thing, that I have a right to life. Well, no, if I hold your head underwater for 20 minutes, you're going to die. You don't have a, some, you know, because, and this is the thing, whenever somebody starts talking about they have a right to something, ask them, use Socratic questioning, and ask them to define exactly what a right is. You will find that rights are something people like to talk about, but they don't really know what it is. Typically, the Idiots will tell you, well, I have my rights because of the Constitution, which, of course, is terrifying because if rights come from the Constitution and the Constitution can, in fact, be amended, as it can, that means that rights can simply vanish whenever the Constitution is amended. But then that's a discussion all about rights, which we're not going into. The only point here is that an anarcho-capitalist is somebody who adheres to the zero-aggression principle and respects the property rights of others. What's next? Now, I'm going to throw this in. Because here on this show, I spend a lot of time insulting people, making fun of people, passing judgment on people. 
And a while back, I had some moron leave a comment somewhere. It might have been on YouTube. It doesn't matter. And I'll talk about that in a minute. About how if you're a libertarian, and I try not to use the word libertarian, even though this is called Cynical Libertarian Society, because right now, conservative Republicans are trying to co-opt the word libertarian. This is why people like Julie Berensky calls herself a libertarian, why Glenn Beck calls himself a libertarian. Right? These are right-wing statists. They are not libertarians. But just as communist and socialist took the word liberal, because communist and socialist are bad words, and now, of course, liberal is becoming a bad word. The conservatives are trying to get a hold of the word libertarian because conservative is becoming a bad word. So eventually, libertarian is also going to become a bad word and will have to be abandoned. This is why I stick with anarcho-capitalist because nobody except an anarcho-capitalist is going to call themselves an anarcho-capitalist because the words anarchy and capitalism are so terrifying to the 99%. No one, except the true devoted ANCAP, is going to be willing to call themselves those things. All right, now I'm off topic. What is I supposed to be? Oh, yes, why do I make fun of people? All right, I got this comment somewhere about how, well, you're a libertarian. You have to accept other people. No, 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 no. And this is the sort of thinking that... I have a limited amount of tolerance for. I'll explain these things, but I'm only going to explain them so many times. As an anarcho-capitalist, you don't give up your, oh God, dare I say, your right. Your right. You don't give up your right. You don't have any fucking rights. Being an anarcho-capitalist does not mean you cannot critique other people. It doesn't mean you can't criticize other people. It doesn't mean you can't make fun of other people. It doesn't mean you cannot insult other people. It does not mean you cannot disapprove of other people. Being an anarcho-capitalist means you cannot initiate violence against other people and you cannot violate their property rights. I'm using the word rights again for lack of a better word. So, for example, I can point out that women with short hair are mentally damaged. That's why they've cut their hair off in a deliberate attempt to become less feminine. I can point out that women who have piercings and tattoos are engaging in the mutilation of their body. I can point out that women who are single mothers are really stupid and that by having a child without a father, they are destroying the child's life because a child without a father is, statistically speaking, more likely to be a criminal, more likely to have mental problems, yada, yada, yada. And I can point out they're making a giant mistake. Right? I can point all of these things out. And I can do that as an anarcho-capitalist. Because in pointing these things out, first of all, they're true. Second of all, in pointing these things out and referring to these women as damaged goods and broken human beings, I am not initiating aggression against them, although, of course, the feminist statist will argue it is because from the feminist statist perspective, anytime you criticize another person, it's aggression, yet, oddly enough, the feminist statist consistently criticize men and magically, that somehow is not aggression. And what I just did right there is called a is called logic, which is what femistatus can't do. But anyhow, in pointing out that broken women are broken, I'm not initiating aggression against them, despite what they would like to think, nor am I violating their property rights. In no way have I taken anything from them. I haven't taken their money. I haven't taken their food. I haven't taken their clothing. I have not stolen from them. I've not broken anything that belongs to them. I haven't set fire to their house. I haven't raped them. I have not assaulted them. I have not punched them in the face. I have not hit them with a baseball bat. In no way at all does criticizing other people violate the non-aggression principle or violate property rights. 
So yes, as an ANCAP, you can criticize other people. I can criticize other people. And I do it quite a bit. One of the founding cons well, founding concept is a bad. See, this is what I'm talking about, self-editing right here. Founding concept is completely wrong word. One of the mechanisms anarcho-capitalism uses to enforce things like the zero aggression principle and property rights is in fact the concept of shaming. In our society today, if you steal $100 from somebody, people want you to go to prison where your existence will be paid for and supported by the taxpayers. In an ANCAP society, if you stole $100, you wouldn't go to prison. It's just that everybody around you, once they found out about it, would make fun of you and they would tell you, if you don't pay the $100 back to the person you stole it from, I'm never going to talk to you again and I'm going to make fun of you on the internet and call you names. And this will be far more effective than putting somebody in prison. And I'm not going to sit here and try to support that thesis right now because that's not what this is about, but I know most of you just freaked out at the idea that putting criminals in prison isn't the way to solve things. Well, welcome to reality. Randy, where are we on time? Oh, great, I got like 10 minutes left. Okay, where am I? So that's why I can make fun of people. That's why I can shame people. Because being an ANCAP does not mean you're not allowed to have opinions about other people. It's like, all right, I can have an opinion about transgendered people. I can say that people who are transgendered are fucking freaks. I can say that. What I can't do is kill them or rape them or hit them with baseball bats or throw things through their windows or steal their property. But I can have the fucking opinion which can be supported by facts that people who are transgendered are freaks in the sense that they are mentally broken. I get to fucking have that opinion. And no, it's not violence. Again, you can always tell... <sighs> yes, all right. <laughs> now, right, now Randy is stopping me. She's like, don't go down that rabbit hole. <sighs> I will not go down that rabbit hole. Let's finish this up. God, I actually have a lot to do. Shit. Okay, why didn't you... Why I do not respond to your retarded-ass comments on Facebook and YouTube and other social media? It's because I just don't give a shit. I don't put any effort, much effort, into the Facebook and the YouTube. Those are just there as an alternate way of getting this podcast out to people. If you're looking for a response to your comment, first of all, it needs to be intelligent and it needs to be a question... Because if you're just commenting, I mean, okay, you, you said a statement. I don't respond to statements. I might respond to questions if they're intelligent, but not statements. Leave the comment question on the website if you want a response. I don't take time out of my life to respond on Facebook and YouTube because, again, I have shit to do, and you're not in there. Why do I go out of my way, and I do go out of my way, to be offensive? I use a lot of bad language. I call people motherfuckers. I refer to people as cunts. I rant and rave. I do this because... I know human nature, and I know that calling femistatist cunts will get their attention. And the thing is, if I piss you off enough you might actually start thinking. And if you start thinking, then you might realize the error of your statist ways. I'm also going out of my way to be offensive because it's catharsis. If you don't know what catharsis is, use the fucking internet. It's called Google. Look it up. I'm not your fucking dictionary. So I'm offensive because it gets attention... And in pissing people off, because this is, you know, it, things that piss you off are things you actually pay attention to. Again, sad state of human nature. 
But the things that get shared the most on the internet are the things that generate the most anger, right? If somebody really pisses you off, you think about it, you talk about it, you tell everybody else about it. Now this moves us into the place where people say to me, well, but if you weren't so rude, if you didn't call people names, if you weren't screaming fuck you and all this other shit all the time, maybe you would be able to convince people more. This, first of all, is based on the faulty premise that people are convinced by logic and reasoning. And they're not, do some research, their studies after studies after studies have been conducted, which have shown people use virtually no logic and reasoning in making their decision about up and down, right and wrong, left and right. More importantly, and this goes contrary to what I just said about if I piss you off enough, you might think, and you might change the way you think. Ultimately, the point of stating the obvious in the other podcast is not to persuade you or convince you or change your thinking, because I cannot persuade you. Only you can persuade yourself. Okay, nobody convinced me to be an ANCAP. I convinced myself. I did research, I thought about things, I read philosophy books, I listened to philosophy podcasts, I listened to philosophy YouTube videos, right? I looked at current events, I utilized logic, I analyzed things. I came to the position of being an ANCAP through my own thought process. So I'm not putting a lot of effort into convincing other people. That's not the point. And I can't convince other people. And more importantly, I simply, to a great extent, don't care about convincing other people because if, as a human being, if you put too much effort into trying to change other people, you're going to be really unhappy because you can't change other people. You have to simply worry about yourself, change yourself, be there with yourself, for yourself, and of course, to a greater extent, the people who are the loved ones in your life. So here's the analogy I like to make. Let's say that there's a train track, and let's say there's a train coming. Let's say that I'm standing on the train track, and I see the train coming. Okay, I can control myself, I can make my own decisions, and my life is important to me. So I can step off of the train track and get out of the way. Now, let's say that somebody whom I love and care about, one of my friends, is standing on the train track. And I see the train is coming. And I say to her, hey, Alice, there's a train coming. And Alice says to me, oh, God, we're going to go long. See, here we go. Bad, bad, great one. Bad. (laughs) Slap your hand. Randy, just deal with it. We're going to have to go long because I'm not going to finish this up. Yes, deal with it. Where? Whoops, there it is. All right, done. See, now I forgot. Oh, yes, train track. So Alice is standing on the train track. There's a train coming, and I say, hey, Alice, there's a train coming. And Alice says, I don't believe you. There's no train. In Alice's case, because she's somebody I love and I care about, I can say, look, Alice, there's a train coming. If you turn around and look, you'll be able to see it and you'll hear it. It's going to blow its whistle because it's we're in downtown Fort Collins and it blows the fucking whistle constantly and shatters all of the fucking windows. Let's say Alice won't turn around, so I can walk over there eventually and grab Alice and spin her around and force her to see the train coming and then she can get out of the way. Or if we're really desperate... I can grab Alice and physically drag her off of the railroad tracks so the train doesn't hit her. Here, I'm trying to control another person's behavior, which requires a lot of effort and may go against their wishes, but I'm doing it because I really care about Alice. Alice is very important to me and I love her. Now, most of you out there don't fit into that category. Most of you out there are what I call the 99%. You're a bunch of statist cocksuckers who believe everything you see on television, if it's said by the appropriate politician, right? Either 
I don't know who's who the Republicans are ass kissing these days because Romney is dead and Sarah Palin is passe. I think that that fat Christie guy wasn't he really popular? But anyway, so some of you believe whatever the designated Republican of the hour says. Some of you just believe whatever the Messiah Hussein Obama says. But you're all 99 percenters. You're all statists. You all have no concept of economy, of logic, of reasoning, of philosophy, of non-aggression, yada, yada, yada. So, for the most part, whenever I'm recording an episode of Stating the Obvious, whatever, and you're sitting out there saying, well, great one, you need to not be so offensive because you're not going to persuade anybody. Well, here's the analogy I make to explain to you why I'm not interested in persuading you. Let's say that Bob is standing on the train track and there's a train coming and I say, hey Bob, there's a train coming. You might want to get off the train track. It's going to hit you and you're going to die. And Bob says, I don't believe you. Okay. What do I give a shit? I just move back so that the blood doesn't hit me, and I watch. I mean, this happened with the housing bubble. How many people said, hey, there's gonna, there's a housing bubble, it's gonna burst, all these loans aren't gonna get paid off. Did anybody listen? No, of course not. War in Afghanistan. Mm, hey, let's go make a war in Afghanistan. That'll be really quick and easy. There can't possibly be any negative ramification. No, 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 of course not. And you guys just rushed in. Why try to persuade you? War in Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. Really? Sure, whatever. Why should I try to persuade you? The upcoming education bubble. Where the college diplomas are going to become even more worthless than they are now. Where the number of college loans not being paid back is going to increase... I mean, why should I try hard to persuade you of this when all I need to do is stand back and let it happen? You know, the impending economic collapse of the United States. They keep printing money. The government keeps spending. The deficit's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More and more people are on welfare. It's going to fail. Why should I put a whole lot of effort into convincing you of something that somebody with even the most basic knowledge of math and accounting can understand? Right? Obamacare. It can't possibly work. Now, will I do an episode explaining why Obamacare can't possibly work? Sure. But am I going to try really, really fucking hard to persuade you? And am I going to not use any bad language? And am I going to come over and hold your hand and coddle you and all this other shit in some desperate attempt to convince you that Obamacare can't work? I mean, financially, mathematically, it's impossible for this to work. Am I really going to put all this great effort into convincing you of this as if convincing you, and this is the arrogance, right? When I say to Bob, hey, Bob, there's a train coming. You might want to get out of the way. And Bob says, no, there isn't. The idea that Bob is so fucking important that I'm supposed to drop everything I'm doing and just work so hard to convince Bob there's a train coming so that Bob doesn't die. No, fuck you, Bob. If you're too goddamn stupid to hear the train coming, to turn around and see the train moving towards you, why in fuck's name should I work so fucking hard to save your worthless life? Right. So when people are going to college to get their degree in Latino American studies with a minor in English literature, I will explain to them that you're not going to make any money with that and that's a really stupid thing to major in, but I'm not going to physically stop you from doing it. I'm not going to put that much effort into persuading you that you're making a bad mistake which is going to ruin your life and you're not going to be able to pay back your college loans making $8 an hour at fucking Starbucks. You're just not worth it. And this arrogance that you people out there have when you say, well, if you didn't use the word fuck so much, maybe you could convince me that you're right. 
what you need to understand is that I don't give a fuck about convincing you that you're right. Again, there's a train coming. I'm going to get off the tracks. You're going to stay on the tracks. I don't give a shit. Stay on the fucking railroad track. Get hit by the train. I don't give a shit. Again, being an anarcho-capitalist doesn't mean you care about everybody in the world. It means you don't initiate aggression against them, and it means you don't violate their property rights. If I warn you there's a train coming and you don't listen, fuck you. And this is why I don't get into arguments with people on YouTube and shit trying to convince them. It's also because arguing on the internet is like running in the Special Olympics. Even if you win, you're still retarded. Right? I'm not going to argue with some fuckers on YouTube leaving comments on my videos because I don't give a shit about these fuckers and because I'm not retarded. Where did we do? Train analogy. Did that one. Right. Now, the next point on the why I'm not going to argue with you. Or let me restart that. The next thing when people say, well, but if you didn't call people cunts and you didn't say fuck you and all this other shit, if you would just have a rational conversation with people, maybe you could convince them. So let's talk about that. The whole have a rational conversation with people. Most people, the 99%, are not capable of having rational conversations. If you, as a 99%er, had what it takes to have a rational conversation, you would not be a 99%er. You would be an anarcho capitalist. Or, best case scenario, you'd be a minarchist. Worst case scenario, excuse me. Here's the analogy I use for this one I cannot have a conversation with a neurosurgeon about brain surgery because I do not know enough about brain surgery to have a conversation or a discussion with a neurosurgeon. When I use the words conversation and discussion, here's what I mean by that. And you'll notice I'm defining my terms. This is one of the things that separates me from you. If you're a 99%er, to have a conversation or a discussion with somebody means that each person in the conversation or discussion, whichever we want to call it, I use the terms interchangeably in this case, means that both people in the discussion are contributing more or less equally to the discussion and the material being discussed and the knowledge being shared. Right. So I know what a surgeon is. I know what a hospital is. I've worked in hospitals. I know a little bit about. I know about sterile procedures and stuff like that. I know what a brain is. I know where the brain is at. I know where that person's head is, and so forth and so on. But the neurosurgeon knows far more about brain surgery than I do, and so I cannot have a conversation with a neurosurgeon about brain surgery. I do not possess the necessary knowledge, background, experience, levels of articulation, terminology, and so forth to have a conversation with a neurosurgeon about brain surgery. The neurosurgeon can lecture to me about brain surgery, but I cannot have a conversation with him. Now, the same thing works when it comes to political philosophy. I always have these people, they want to have conversations with me about politics. You can't because you don't know anything about political philosophy. You don't know anything about philosophy. In the analogy, I'm me and the brain surgeon is the neurosurgeon. In reality, I'm the neurosurgeon and you're me. When people want to come up and try to talk to me about how Obamacare is going to work, these are people who don't understand logic. They don't understand logical syllogisms. They don't understand the non-aggression principle. They don't understand philosophy. They don't understand first principles in philosophy. They don't understand economics. They don't understand how the government works. They don't understand the concept of the gun in the room. They don't understand property rights. These are people who have never read a fucking philosophy book in their life. And so when they come up to me and they want to have a discussion with me about 
how wonderful Obamacare is or how them brown people in them Arab countries hate us or how if you disagree with Obama you're racist or how we need to spend more money on public education or whatever it is. You and I are not going to have that conversation because we cannot have a conversation because you cannot contribute to the conversation. There, I, I've, a comment was just left on one of my YouTube videos today because I get the little notifications. So I see them, I just don't respond. And it said that anar anarcho-capitalism is an oxymoron, so you're wrong. Right? I mean, this is not an argument. This is not... This is not thinking. You can't have a conversation with somebody whose so-called argument consists of saying anarcho-capitalism is an oxymoron because it's not and because they're not elaborating in any sense how and why it's an oxymoron. So I'm not going to have conversations with people about politics and philosophy when those people are not capable of having a conversation. I will talk about it to you. I will lecture you. That's why this podcast is pretty much, for the most part, a one-way communication. Because the simple truth is, those of you out there who are 99 percenters are not capable of engaging in a dialogue with me about philosophy and politics. Those of you out there who are ANCAPs and are capable of engaging in this dialogue, you're welcome to do so. You're completely welcome to do so. But those of you who are 99 percenters, those of you who think, well, if you just didn't use so much bad language, you'd convince people. I mean, if that if that's your level of reasoning, then you're missing. And also the reason I use the bad language is just because it's my shtick. Right? There's, if you want intelligent, articulate anarcho-capitalism that doesn't have bad language, go listen to Bad Quaker, Pop the Bad Quaker Podcast at badquaker.com by Ben Stone. Incredibly intelligent, probably the smartest man in the anarcho-capitalist movement. The smartest. And he was in the hospital a while back. I do not know how Ben Stone is doing right now. Hopefully he is okay because he is absolutely brilliant. Brilliant beyond words. My admiration for Ben Stone's intellectual skills is truly beyond measure. I do not have words to describe how much I admire him. Or if you want articulate ANCAP philosophy that doesn't have very many bad words in it, go listen to Stefan Molyneux. Sometimes Stefan Molyneux drops the F-bomb and stuff, but he's far more, but you know, not anywhere near as much as I do. So my shtick and my niche is being this kind of ranty anarcho-capitalist who uses the word fuck a lot and calls people cunts and everything else. And that's the niche I've carved out for myself, and that's the niche that I enjoy being in. And so no, I'm not going to stop saying fuck you and calling people cunts and all this other shit on the off chain because of this b bizarre belief you have that if I just stop doing that because right that's what pre that's what's preventing me from convincing every statist on the planet earth to be an anarcho-capitalist it's the fact that I use the word fuck no that's not what prevents those of you who are statist from turning into ancaps what's preventing you from becoming an ancap is your own stupidity it has not a fucking thing to do with me or my language. And that's exactly the sort of flaw that you as a statist bring to things. Well, the reason you're not convincing me that anarcho-capitalism is the way to go is because you're using bad language. Notice how you are taking your failings that you can't be an ANCAP and you're throwing it, you're making it my fault. No, no, it's not my fault because of my language that you're not an ANCAP. It's your fault because you're the fucking stupid one. Because you can't take responsibility for persuading yourself because you want somebody else. And again, this is the... Yeah, Randy hates me right now because we're going over. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm so used to it. You know, this is what being a status is about. It's, it's like when, you send you, when a status says to me, Great one, if you didn't use so much bad language, maybe you could convince people. No, it's not my job to convince people. 
you as if you need to take responsibility for your own life and convince yourself. But of course, if you could take responsibility for your own life, then you wouldn't be a statist. So I'm not going to change the way I do things under the premise that this will allow me to convince more people because first of all, I don't give a fuck about convincing you and second of all, I can't convince you. As I've already said, only you can convince yourself. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your life and until you do that, until you're willing to take responsibility for your own life, I am not going to prevent the train from hitting you. I am not going to try hard to convince you that there's a train coming and you need to get off the railroad track. If I say there's a train coming, you need to get off the track, and you say I don't believe you, I'm going to say, well, fine. I don't care. I do not fucking care. Your life is not my fucking responsibility. All right, have I beat that horse to death yet? I'm on my last note here. The other reason I'm not going to have a conversation with you about politics and philosophy isn't simply that you don't know enough about it, but the average person cannot articulate themselves well enough. And again, this also goes back to why I do this show live without editing because I want to force myself to have to articulate accurately. And a lot of times on the show too, you'll hear, I'll do a podcast and then if you listen to the next podcast, I'll come back and I'll say, you know, in the previous podcast I talked about such and such and I need to elaborate on that. Because I'm always pushing myself to accurately articulate what I'm trying to say. And when I fail at that, I usually know it. It's usually pretty fucking obvious to me that I failed. And I will come back and try to fix that. We, as a society, utilize a lot of nebulous language. And the thing about philosophy... Hold on a second. I've got to stand up because my ass hurts. Deal with it. A lot of times I record this standing up. Today I did it sitting down because this was this was originally going to be shorter than normal. That makes Randy laugh her ass off when she hears me say that. Because the odds of me going shorter than normal are pretty fucking slim. God, I love the sound of my own voice. All right, well, what the fuck was I talking about? Where are my notes? Yes, articulating. In our society, we don't articulate very well because we use a lot of words which are what I call nebulous words. These nebulous words, they have meaning, but they don't have meaning. Some examples of that, all politicians do this, but Hussein Obama, your Lord and Savior, is truly the master of nebulous words. This man ran two campaigns for president based entirely on three words, hope, change, and forward. Now, each of those words has a very specific meaning. If you look at it in a dictionary, it has a very precise meaning. They also, at the same time, mean absolutely nothing. They mean everything. They mean nothing and they have a precise definition at the same time. That is what makes a nebulous word. So let me explain this. Change. Change, in a precise way, it means an alteration to the current state of affairs. That's a definition I'm making up. I'm not reading that out of the dictionary. You can look in the dictionary and see what the actual definition is. There is one. There's an actual definition, right? So. If I have, I have a pencil that's right here and it's sitting on the desk. I say, I'm going to change the location of the pencil. So I pick up the pencil with my hand and I put the pencil over there. I have now changed the location of the pencil. Now when Obama says, I'm going to bring change, it's completely nebulous. 
what does that mean? And if you know anything about neuro-linguistic programming and such as that, and actual persuasion, as in how the brain is persuaded, emotions, yada, 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 you'll, you'll get some of this. When Obama says, if you elect me, you're going to get change, when all the people out there hear him say change, there's no details associated with what this change means. So if you're anti-war and Obama says change, in your mind you translate this and, oh, he's going to change things. Okay, so you're going to think about how he's going to change things for the better if you believe in him. Now, if you're a Republican, you're against Obama, when he says he's going to change things, you're going to take the word change and put a negative spin on it. So the Democrat voter is going to say, oh, he's going to change things. He's going to end the war. While the Republican voter, when he hears Obama say, I'm going to change things, the Republican voter says, yes, he's going to enforce more gun control. Now, at no point has Obama said, I'm going to end the war, nor has Obama said, I'm going to implement more gun control. He said no such fucking thing. All he said was change. The people who hear the word change create the meaning for that word that they want the word to mean to them. And this is what I mean when I say that as a nebulous word, it has no meaning at all. It means nothing, but it also means everything. Because it means everything in the sense that as the person hearing Obama say change, you put whatever meaning you want on that word. Exact same thing with hope, exact same thing with forward, right? If you're in Nazi Germany and you've seen some of your Jewish friends rounded up and taken away and a politician comes out and he says, I offer hope. So if you're this Jew who's seen your Jewish friends taken away, hope to you might mean that you're going to get your Jew your friends are going to be released from wherever they were taken and the gold that was confiscated from you and the weapons that were confiscated you are going to be returned. Whereas if that same politician says hope and you're in Nazi Germany and you're a member of the Nazi party, then the word hope may mean that you're going to get the rest of the Jews rounded up and get them out of Berlin also so that Berlin can go back to being this sparkling, shining city on the hill. Okay, So words like change and hope and forward, when a politician says those, they have no meaning yet they mean absolutely everything because those words mean anything to the individual people. Every individual hears what they want to hear. Just to make sure the horse is dead and sufficiently beat, another classic example of this is, of course, our favorite climate change, which used to be called global warming, but it's not getting any warmer, so there was a problem with that because global warming is not completely nebulous because warming is a word that has a meaning that's not quite as nebulous as hope, change, and forward. Okay, This is why global warming was changed to climate change because change, again, what does change mean? It means anything. It means everything. It means nothing. If it's colder today than yesterday, that's climate change. If it's warmer today than yesterday, that's climate change. If it's warmer this year than last year, that's climate change. If it's colder this year than last year, climate change. If it rains more this year than last year, climate change. If it rains less, climate change. If there's more tornadoes, it's climate change. If there are fewer tornadoes, climate change. If the El Nino comes sooner, that's climate change. The El Nino comes later. That's climate change. If there's more cloud cover, climate change. If there's less cloud cover, climate change. If the glaciers recede, climate change. If the glaciers expand, climate change. Do you get the fucking point? If you don't, you are so stupid that you should kill yourself. By the way, 
encouraging people to kill themselves does not violate the non-aggression principle. If I take a shotgun and shoot you, I have initiated aggression against you. I have violated the non-aggression principle. If I say to you, you, in your effort to save the environment and make the world a better place, should kill yourself because every day that you're alive, you're utilizing electricity, which is created by burning fossil fuels, which are polluting the environment and causing climate change, and you do choose, thank God, it would be wonderful to actually kill yourself, as I've suggested. That is not a violation of the non-aggression principle. So thanks to nebulous language, most people cannot communicate. And here's how this manifests in the real world when politics comes up, yada, yada, yada. And so, for example, I will say, there's no such thing as global warming. And then an idiot in the room, and there's almost always an idiot in the room, will say, well, can you explain why there's no such thing as global warming? And I will say, yes. And then there's some silence like that. A little bit more. Then the idiot will say, okay. And I will say, were you speaking to me? And they'll say, yes. And I will say, okay is not a question, it's a statement. How am I supposed to respond to that? And then they will say, well, you said you could explain glo why global warming doesn't exist. Explain it. And I will say, yes. Your question was, can I explain why there is no such thing as global warming? And the answer is yes, I can explain that. Your question was not, can you explain to me right now why there is no such thing as global warming? Are you asking me to explain to you right now why there is no such thing as global warming? And they will say, yes, that's what I meant. And then I will say, but it doesn't fucking matter what you mean. It only matters what you say. If I say, I want to go out and shoot some black people with my, near, with my new deer rifle, but what I mean is, I want to go out and pet some kittens. Does it matter what I said or what I meant? Well, what matters is what I said, because nobody else has access to what I mean in my brain, unless I clearly articulate it. So when you say to me, let's say you're a 99 percent or statist idiot, you say to me, well, can you explain why global warming isn't real? And I say, yes, yes, I can explain it. But what you're trying to ask me, but which you cannot articulate, because you have no linguistic skills, even though you have a fucking college diploma. I really love talking to people who like majored in English literature and can't fucking form a question. God, that's a worthless diploma. So when you say, can you explain why global warming doesn't exist? What you're trying to say is, what you're trying to ask is, can you explain to me right now why global warming doesn't exist? Those are two different questions. Your inability to differentiate those questions tells me that you do not have the articulation and language skills necessary to accurately communicate what you're thinking. If you can't accurately communicate what you're thinking, it's unlikely you're going to be able to accurately understand what I am saying. Therefore, for me to attempt to communicate with you is a waste of time. The reason I cannot explain to you right now why there's no such thing as global warming is because, first of all, you have no communication skills. You don't have the ability to say what you think and think what you say. You are lacking self-awareness. You don't know how to define your terms. And on top of all of that, the idea that, again, in our society, everybody wants everything quick and short, like their penises. You know, when somebody says, can you explain why there's no global warming? Well, yes, I can, but it's going to take a couple of hours. 
it's not like politics, right? This is not a presidential campaign where the entire platform is one word. Well, why does global warming not exist? Well, hope. Oh, yeah, right. You I mean you cannot explain something like why there's no such thing as global warming in 140 characters. It takes a long time. And then, of course, this brings us back to the whole concept of, so you want me to explain to you why there's no such thing as global warming. First, you explain to me why should I take two hours out of my life, two hours of my limited time on the planet Earth, to explain to you why there is no such thing as global warming. I mean, who in the fuck are you that you are so arrogant and conceited and egotistical that I am supposed to provide you with two hours of my life to educate you about something? Why would I do that? Now, if you want to pay me to explain to you why there's no global warming, that's different. But very seldom does anybody offer me money. They just expect me, well, explain why such and such. Uh, fuck you. You fucking figure it out. I am not your goddamn slave. I am not here to fucking teach you shit unless you're paying me. That's what this podcast is for. If you really want the benefit of my political, philosophical, social, economic knowledge, that's what this fucking podcast is for. Don't come at me and talk about, well, you need to explain to me why such and such. No, you need to go fuck yourself. It is not up to me to explain jack shit to you on demand at your convenience. So just chill the fuck out. All right. We did it. How do we do, Randy? An hour and 23 minutes. God damn it, I can fucking talk. All right, play the music. Boom. Let us let us move on. Cuz we both have other things to do. And to you listeners, uh, I'll be back. Probably the next podcast is going to be another of the Pile on My Floor series, which I'm trying to get through. Anyway, something's coming, and I, I, try, I promise I will try to scream fuck you and cunt a lot more in the next podcast, because I know it's pretty mellow, and I let some of you down. All right, see ya. Bye-bye.